Hello, everyone. Good morning and good evening. I'm Naina, your moderator for today's webinar. Welcome to our webinar on optimizing verification methodology. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, optimizing verification methodology for ensuring risk five core integrity. We are thrilled to have you join us and look forward to an engaging and insightful discussion. Let me set the stage now. This webinar is the fourth of ACL Digital's webinar series, Unleashing the Silicon Odyssey, where our semiconductor experts delve into the world of risk 5 We are here to explore the endless possibilities it brings from AI, machine learning, and automotive tech to data centers, mobile devices, and consumer electronics. That's a lot. Sounds exciting, right? We'd love to have you join us for the entire series. Keep an eye on your inbox. We'll be sending you the details very soon, along with a sneak peek at the interesting topics we've lined up. So before we start our discussion, I'll give a brief introduction about ACL Digital and Vioma Systems. I'll also introduce our speakers, Lavanya and Purnima. ACL Digital, is a leading solution engineering company catering to customers across various industry segments such as telecom, semiconductors, healthcare, networking, retail, life sciences, and media. As part of the Alton Group, we have a strong global presence in over 30 countries and a workforce of over 57,000 skilled professionals. With a revenue of 4 billion US dollars, we have established ourselves as a trusted provider of innovative solutions. You can check out our website, www.acldigital.com, for more details. Vioma Systems, our partner for this webinar, provides RISC-V ecosystem solutions in the areas of verification, emulation, and software stack for processor implementations and SOCs. Vioma offers a unique RISC-V ecosystem as a service platform accessible via cloud and on-premises. The platform delivers ready-to-deploy verification and software IPs to accelerate the time to market for its five product. Our speaker from ACL Digital, Purnima SP, is a CPU verification architect. Purnima has over 18 years of experience in chip development. Her expertise encompasses system verilog, UVM, and formal verification methodologies with a strong foundation in cash coherency and hardware trace analysis. With a successful 16-year tenure at IBM and her current leadership role at ACL Digital, she brings deep knowledge and proven success in RISC-V core development for cluster-based SOCs, interfaces, and peripherals in ML-based SOCs, using C tests in UVM environment and vector processing for streaming data. Our guest speaker, Lavanya, is a risk five veteran and the founder and CEO of Vioma Systems. She has over 13 years of experience across various processor teams and has been part of IBM ARM processor verification teams and led the risk five processor verification efforts at Rambus, Chip Technologies and Shakti Group at IIT Madras. Another interesting fact is that Lavanya is a risk five ambassador for India. Those are two amazing and inspiring profiles Let's aim to get the most out of this webinar. Here's how things will unfold. Lavanya and Purnima will take the stage and share valuable insights for about 40 minutes. After that, we'll dive into a Q&A session where you can ask your questions. To ensure your questions are answered, type them in the Q&A box. Lavanya and Purnima will answer them at the end of the presentation. So keep the questions coming. Uh, the floor is now yours, Lavanya and Purnima. Thank you. Thank you, Naina, for that wonderful introduction. Good, good morning, all, and good evening. Let's see what we are going to cover in during this webinar. So first, we'll start with the introduction for RISC-V comparison with other ACS, some of the benefits of RISC-V, and why RISC-V is gaining the momentum these days in the semiconductor industry and promises of open ASA, what are all the implementation challenges and some of the pipeline architecture and LSU and caches. And then finally, we'll 
close with the verification challenges and how it's being closed. So uh, coming to introduction, this file is an open standard architecture, which is based on the principle of risk, which is nothing but the reuse instruction set, which means that processor will use the small and highly performing optimal set of instruction. So this file provides a fundamental instruction sets and a register on top of that where users can build. Some of the benefits offered by RIS5 are it's open collaborative, which will make the innovation faster among the stakeholders. It's flexible, allows a customization, which will allow user to build their own extension based on the feature they want. And it's efficient, highly performing, which reduces the complexity of overhead of instruction decode and execution. It is compatible and portable, which simplifies the software and hardware across the various platforms. When we compare this file with other ISAs, the ISA type used by this file is a risk-based architecture. X86 uses the sys-based, which uses the complex instruction set architecture, and ARM uses the RISC five based architecture. When it comes to licensing, RISC five provides a open source, whereas X86 and ARM provides a proprietary. Hardware and software ecosystem for a RISC five is still evolving, but for the X86 and ARM, they are very well established. Customization option provided by RISC-5 is very high, which is why it's gaining the attraction. And X86 is very limited, and ARM is also very limited. So come to some of the benefits of RISC-5. It is giving the opportunity to develop a semiconductor processor with faster time, which will reduce the scratch development from the beginning. It provides the reusability and modularity where we can use the lot of existing application with a modular functional approach. And it provides a ISA, which are based on the current technologies and development. It provides a customization where the users can build on their own instruction set to support their feature on the existing ISA. It provides a symmetric encoding, which is providing the both encoding and decoding logic with the same logic. And it needs a minimum support of only additional hardware, which supports the base, base ISA. It also provides a scalability where people can develop from consumer electronic to high performing data centers. And with all these advantages, RISC-5 is bringing a new attention to open source hardware platform, which the growing recognition for the hardware starting more and more people in the various industry, which demands for customization hardware and many startups are leveraging this and building a many accelerator based on AM, ML based algorithms, which is why this five is leading the transformation for many silicon with the consumer electronics data centers and different other application as shown in this diagram. Over to you, Lavanya, to continue with promises of ISA. Thanks, Purnima. Hi, everyone. Now that we have established what RISC-5 means to the emerging uh, semiconductor market, we will dive deeper into what are the challenges a RISC-5 business faces from the point of view of uh, verification. And specifically, we will go back to what we have read in our engineering related to computer architecture and how we can relate that to uh, the verification of risk by implementations. So what is this promise of an open ISA? We know that uh, RISC-V forms as an interface between the hardware and the software. 
and the specification itself helps us uh, demarcate the software above which is developed in c or other high level languages uh, and below that is the hardware that understands the binaries so the specification here itself will provide us three main things basically the instruction encodings uh, like uh, the opcodes uh, that are part of what makes the uh, processor run and the register files uh, the general purpose registers the floating point register the control and transfer register forms uh, part of the specification definition itself ha along with that there is also modes of operation uh, related to machine mode uh, user mode supervisor and hypervisor modes how uh, all these instructions and register files work in collaboration with these will be presented here so as we can see the complexity of the risc five specification comes from its varied uh, flexibility in the extensions we have base extension as well as uh, we have the base isa and as well as uh, various extension that supports the uh, flexibility that uh, risc five forms as uh, targeting the embedded world to server market uh, in the in that regard we can see that uh, the spec itself uh, brings in the complexity for verification where the verification also has to take care this complexity and the configurability of the isa so we can see that uh, the implementation challenges for this comes from uh, when a design engineer takes the specification he takes that and implements the uh, design in any hardware description language along with that the verification of that has to take care of the implementation uh, principles that are governed by the pipelining the hazards the memory hierarchy uh, as well as uh, the micro architectural details in branch prediction or how the processor is de defined in terms of in order and out of order processors along with that if there is any performance improvements also needed in terms of multi core and uh, cache coherency that is required those are also have to be covered as part of the verification let's dive deeper into the details of it so what we are going to see are uh architecture diagrams that we already know of or how the designer is going to implement that risc5 isa from that perspective we see what an verification engineer has to take care of and what kind of complexities they bring in for the first to start with we have the pipelining where every instruction in risc5 goes through instruction fetch uh decode execute and uh, memory as well as write back so we have to make sure that in our verification suite which consists of both directed and uh, randomized risc5 instructions where we see a combination of all the instruction going through all pipeline stages the isa defines the instructions but the implementation brings in the pipelining capability which has to be covered within the uh, verification suite so that is the first step in our verification the second we also look at uh, how all this pipeline data paths are covered we look at different blocks where the pc the program counter for every risc5 instruction is fetched and then uh, the instruction is decoded along with that it goes to the next pipeline stage where uh, the register uh, is indexed and the values are read so here we have to make sure that all possible combinations of values within the registers are exercised so as to exercise uh, the block the execute block of the design where the actual instruction execution happens along with that in case of memory and data transfer instruction we uh, access the memory uh, of the processor and hence all address value combinations as well as data combinations have to be covered we are slowly going into the details of what constitutes or what we define as coverage in the verification methodology and how exhaustive or complex it comprehensive it becomes in a process of verification environment so during this data path we cover all operand values 
that can be exercise that can exercise different blocks within this implementation. Once the pipeline data path is covered, we have to also make sure, as we see, the control path, which directs different instruction types to different parts of the design, as well as the micro architectural details. For example, if there is a branch instruction, then we know that it's going to exercise, if for performance branch predictors are involved, then it's going to exercise those blocks. So the coverage of the completeness of verification for this control path comes from the coverage of all types of instruction as well as the micro architectural details related to the type of instruction that we are covering. So this is where uh, uh, both simulation and formal type of verification come into picture where we exercise different blocks and the control path of the design. Along with the pipelining, the next stage of performance metrics that we have are uh, related to what are known as hazards. To overcome uh, the pipelining hazards, uh, to bring up the speed up, we know that the result of the instruction will be uh, carried over to the subsequent instruction. Or in other words, the subsequent instruction is dependent upon the execution of the previous instruction. We need not wait till uh, the instruction is written back to the register to process that uh, uh, operand because that gives us a lot of wasteful cycles. There are also implementations that uh, provide uh, these blue lines in indirectly means micro architectural speed up where you provide a forwarding logic so that the execution stage uh, results are carried to the uh, decode stage of the next subsequent instruction. So these kind of scenarios is what something that uh, a verification engineer has to be aware of and should make sure that uh, these compute uh, instructions can be interleaved in such a way that they are dependent on previous instruction and they bring in that stress to the verification of that logic. The data forwarding can also happen between not just to compute instruction, but also between a memory instruction as well as a compute instruction. What is different here? The difference is the logic uh, gets its value from the memory stage. The latest updated value cannot come from the execute stage where the address calculation happens, but from the memory stage where the latest value for that operand is obtained, and that gets forwarded to the uh, subsequent instruction calculation. In this way, even though the logic is same, the way they access the pipeline stages is different. We have to know that these kind of combinations of instructions are also uh, have to be part of our verification suite. The understanding of the basic architecture underlying the risk file helps us verify uh, more completely the risk file implementation. So that is the idea of the session. Moving forward, along with the data uh, hazards happening with memory and compute instructions, we have control hazards happening with control transfer instruction. If you see here, there is a branch instruction that is happening and uh, the subsequent instructions will would have been fetched as part of the pipeline architecture itself. If it has to be flushed, and the branch is going to be taken, then those, those logic have to be checked uh, as part of our verification suit also. In addition to that, if there are prediction, uh, micro architectural details are also present, so as to speed up this branch prediction capabilities, then we have to make sure that the prediction has happened correctly or mispredicted and accordingly, those logic has been exercised and the coverage of those microarchitectural blocks, is it possible to cover them at the architectural uh, test suite itself? Putting it all together, just to summarize, we know that as a pipeline architecture, each instruction goes through several stages where instruction fetch, decode, uh, uh, execute, memory, as well as write back happens. And in such a scenario, if you see the blue operands, they are dependent across several in instructions. 
and accordingly the logic as you see on the right picture also brings in extra micro architectural details where you can speed up the execution of these instructions by forwarding or uh, providing the data to uh, the subsequent instruction at earlier stages so these kind of scenarios uh, when we see a, a processor verification it has to be multiplied with the capability or the amount of randomness that we can bring in verification along with the randomness it cannot be completely random it has to also cover these micro architectural details so that is it exercises those blocks effectively same scenario if we look from the implementation perspective we see that uh, the forwarding unit and the pipeline blocks are affected by such uh, implementation details. And we have to make sure that all combinations of the interfaces are exercised along with the different, crossed with different types of instruction, crossed with the privilege modes in which the processor operates. Getting back to another example, we had seen that it was a case, uh, an example of compute instruction, which was dependent on previous instructions. Here, it's a combination of memory access instruction along with compute instruction, so which spans across different uh, instructions, as well as not just one, but several uh, register operands can also be dependent on each other. So this kind of exercise we see in a snippet of five instruction has to be extended to millions and millions of instruction so that all possible scenarios within the processor is uh, exercised along with having this memory, waiting for the memory to give the latest value, which gets updated to the subsequent registers. Yeah, in terms of uh, branch instructions in the same uh, scenario, we see that the subsequent instruction has to be flushed along with taking care of these data forwarding complexities. Over to you, uh, Purnima, where we bring in, uh, we have seen that uh, compute and uh, data hazard related complexities. Purnima will describe the memory hierarchy complexities uh, for verification. Yeah. Thanks, Lavanya, for setting it. So we all know that to improve the performance of the processor, we are bringing in the cache in between the processor and the main memory, which will speed up the access. Even though it speed up the access, it brings its own complication and complexity in terms of verification. Where while designing a cache, we have to take care of how we are going to set the tag size of the society, how we are going to size of the cache and how much it's needed. And also when it comes to uh, searching through caches, what is the algorithm we are going to use and what is the algorithm we are going to use to maintain the coherency. And so all these will add its own complexity and it will also create a pipeline Tolls. And if it's going to be a cache miss, it is needing a memory access, which will add extra latency and refilling of the caches. What are all the replacement algorithms we are going to use, whether it's a least recently used or first in, first out, random, based on all the application. And what are all the hierarchy level we are going to use, whether L1 cache, L2 cache, or how, how much is the hierarchy needed based on the application. So it all these will add its own complexity to cache, whether we are exercising the cache in all possible states, whether we are exercising the caches as a partially loaded or partially stored is done. So it's like based on the size of the cache, the complexity also in increases, which will give more scope for verification. And coming to virtual memory, we all know that the computer architecture uses a virtual memory 
concept where we have to map the physical address with the corresponding virtual address where we convert the virtual address into physical address and give it to execution units and then on the execution uh, units they lose that physical address so when it comes to paging right each memory we have organized into certain number of pages when we write our tests or suits we have to make sure that we are exercising the instruction or we are exercising the address that will crosses the page boundary and unaligned accesses all these we have to make sure we are going to cover to ma make sure the paging or caching is working correctly and also the locking of the address happens where two instruction work on the same addresses how we are going to take which what are the arbitration logic and with understanding that we are test suit or verification also put those strategies to cover those scenarios. And coming to with the understanding of cache and virtual memory, little bit of details into how low store unit works in the Buddhist five world. So when instruction comes to a LSU, the load store we can categorize into two. One is a load where we are going to read the data from memory. One is a store where we are going to store the data into memory. So it will maintain two separate queues where load will go to a load queue entry and store will go to a store queue entry. So when the instruction first come to LSU, first thing we just discussed that we need a conversion from virtual to physical address. The, that will happen in the TLB lookup where it will go and search in the TLB whether we have a mapping. If we have the mapping, then it will give the physical address. If we get the physical address, the next step is we'll go and look in our data cache, whether the data is present in the cache. If the data is present in the cache, then the operation will perform with that. If it is a load, then we'll read the data back from the cache and give it to the core or processor. If it is a miss in the decast, then we have to spawn an another request to a memory to get the dot line and install that line in the memory. With and same thing happens for the store where first we'll store it in a queue. It will look in the TLB whether the line is present. If it is present, then data will come and we'll store the data into a cache. If it is not there we are going to again perform the memory operation where we can bring in the line to cache. Once the line is there, then we can go and store the data. So with this, we can imagine the complexity if we have a dependent instructions where let's say first we have a store and then dependent load. When we visualize, in the uh, program, it looks sequentially so that load should get the latest data. But in the real world or processor world, it can go out of order with the execution where it can parallelly issue load and it can parallelly issue a store. Though both can execute independently. But in this case, since they are having a data dependency, when the store commit happens or load perform, they have to search in the entries where whether they have a dependent load or they have a dependent uh, store. In those cases, they have to perform and again flush or reissue that uh, specific instruction and then go ahead with the after the first store has completed. So these are the, some of the scenarios where we have to take care in our test suit. We have this kind of scenarios and we are going to cover all these to make sure the architecture is working correctly as expected. Over to you, Lavanya, to continue further. Thanks, Purnima. So on top of... Uh compute complexities, memory hierarchy complexities. We also have synchronous and asynchronous event that 
uh, affect the sequential execution of a processor. So those also have to be covered as part of our verification uh, of a risk for implementation. So these can be either uh, system resets, uh, which uh, manifest itself as exceptions along with other exceptions causing from uh, operating system or a user dependent instruction that is illegal. Uh, along with that, there are also asynchronous interrupts that have to be also taken care where the common, the normal sequential execution program is interrupted and then uh, it uh, goes to a handler and then it returns back to the normal execution. In this scenario, we have to make sure that uh, every instruction has been interrupted. Similarly, it has to have been interrupted at being at different stages of the pipeline. For example, let's bring in the complexity where uh, an exception causing interrupt is uh, ex uh, an exception causing in instruction is interrupted. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, a multi cycle instruction is interrupted, and it also is dependent on a uh, lot of uh, 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 data forwarding logic. So, uh, this is the kind of complex scenarios brings in different features of the processor implementation together at the same time at the ISA level itself, so that you exercise the micro-architecture details. So this, these are the details that has to be covered also. So we have summarized the design features and also from a verification point of view, what kind of complexity gets added for every design feature or the performance improvements that have been brought out in the last uh, uh, several decades of computer architecture research. Uh, we know that this has led to an open ISA called RISPI and the benefits of having a highly flexible, customized uh, ISA based on which the implementation can happen. But this brings in a very costly uh, and time consuming verification challenges and also the coverage uh, involved in uh, understanding the ISA, the configurability, the flexibility, as well as the microarchitectural details of this implementation. So how do we deal with such uh, exhaustive scenarios? Uh, we are going to present that in the subsequent slides. So this, to start with, we first have to uh, have this verification closure in terms of uh, the ISA compliance. So the RISC-V International has a working group that deals with the maintenance of a framework that uh, helps us uh, make sure that the implementation is uh, RISC-V compliant. It basically deals with the, the uh, specification of each and every instruction and whether it has been implemented correctly in the uh, design under test or not. So uh, that is the first step. It is a very small subset of what we generally consider as processor verification. And uh, so the next thing that we jump on is to have the functional uh, coverage uh, defined uh, for uh, the whole processor. So we cover all the features that we have dis described at the ISA level, at the micro architectural level. And we also uh, make sure that uh, these can be automated and uh, uh, can be the metrics can be obtained during our simulation and so once that is done then we have the normal metrics of code coverage for the uh, design logic followed by boot and re reset sequences which is a natural progression of how from the uh, hardware side we move on slowly to the uh, presence of an application software or an OS running on top of the design implementation. On top of that, we also bring in, along with the functional verification, we will also look at the performance and benchmarking of these dis of these uh, designs and make sure that those have been smooth and the bugs do not uh, percolate to the higher level as early as possible. Going into the details, the compliance is a framework written in Python where uh, the design configuration is described using a Python package called RISC-V config. And along with that, there is a, a compliance test generator 
which generates the test according to the configuration provided. So based on these two, we will get a test suit that is applicable for the design that we have implemented. And uh, the test selector makes th those tests to be run on the design. So how do we have the compliance? The test selected is run on the design under test as well as the reference model. The model can be either uh, the, main, the RISPA International Maintained Spike, which is the IS instruction set simulator, or a sale model, which is a RISPA formal model, also maintained by the community. So once we compare the signatures uh, coming out of the DUT as well as the reference model, then uh, the coverage is also obtained from this uh, framework using uh, RISPI ISAC, again, an open source Python package. This whole framework is collectively called uh, RISPI compliance. And uh, once this execution has happened, the comparison is done and all the tests are passing and the coverage metrics have been uh, reported. Then we say that the implementation is compliant to uh, the configuration that we have uh, support. For example, we can say that if we support RV32 IMAC, then the test for that uh, ISA is selected and then run on both the uh, design and the reference model. And the test pass and the coverage reports will be obtained from the framework itself in an automated way. Once this is done, as we have mentioned, we will go on to the mic defining of uh, ISA and microarchitectural coverage. This is where the major grunt work or where we go into full swing of verifying all the features as well as at the ISA and uh, the uh, microarchitectural details where you bring in whether it's a pipeline, the compute blocks, or whether it supports ma uh, uh, multiplier unit or divided unit or floating point unit based on the ISA that is supported and bring in the kind of uh, memory hierarchy uh, that is supported as well as the cache configurations based on which whether we can make sure that we are uh, covering all the replacement policies, uh, the exercising of those logic and making sure that the cache is uh, miss misses and hits happen in different kinds of scenarios and things like that and bringing in branch prediction logic, the verification of it from the point of view of branch instruction itself, covering different scenarios in such a way that that microarchitecture block is also exercised. Along with that, we have seen that uh, the pipelining hazards that we explained. On top of that, there are also added complexity where an out of order processor comes into picture, a quad or a dual issue implementation has happened, or a multi-core with cache potency as well. So we have to bring in a cross of all these uh, ISA, at the ISA level, for example, we cover uh, all the possible scenarios of privilege modes crossed with op codes, crossed with the registers and the register values along with the memory addresses. So this is why the verification space for the risk file explodes. And if we don't take care intelligently at the start itself, then we would have a big, wild uh, implementation in hand, which is difficult to control. So how do we do that? It comes from the definition itself. There are a few uh, non-technical things that helps us solve it. One, the risk file being open, uh, and it has seen a lot of comment, community collaboration at all levels. We would want to also reflect that in uh, the verification space also. Because it's open, uh, it can uh, bring in a lot of collaboration between verification experts and the engineers who have seen problems in their own uh, uh, experience and solve them. The second thing is, uh, since the ISA is standardized and the problems that comes out of those configurable ISAs and extensions would be same across different implementations. So the common problems can be solved in an open way, which can be adopted by uh, everybody in the community. So coming back to the solutions and the challenges that it solves, 
we know that these quality issues is the major thing that decides the success of the RISPR implementation. It is imperative that we have pre-developed verification IPs for all the standard ISA details that are present. Along with that, we can also bring in uh, software infrastructure solutions that uh, they, that has been there in, in terms of dev, DevOps and co-development of both verification and design happening together. So that can also be brought in for as a solution to faster time to market of all these implementations. And another complexity is that, that the differentiation that uh, every uh, design has to bring in, in terms of cost customization, those can also be leveraged by using the existing IP ecosystem and then bringing in a kind of open collaboration to have the uh, customizations very well. In summary, what we have, we have presented is that the exploding verification space for a highly configurable and open ISA and the possibilities of how we can solve them. So one such solution is having a continuous feedback for coverage driven test generation as early as possible in the design. So it, instead of just uh, uh, generating random scenarios, which we hope at some point will cover all the possible scenarios that we have imagined and defined in the verification plan, it would be good to have a continuous feedback of the coverage that is getting generated at very early stages. And also that the feedback for that is given to the test, test generator intelligently in such a way that uh, every simulation cycle matters and it is saved and it is not done uh, as a wasteful simulation to cover the same scenarios again and again. The second optimization solution that we can think of is there are a lot of micro architectural details that have to be covered uh, and is uh, kind of uh, different for different implementation, different designers, different design teams. But if those micro architectural details have some kind of uh, uh, formal semantics that can be translated back to the ISA level, then it's very easy to reproduce the same kind of uh, micro architectural design stresses at the ISA level and they can be used across designs. So this is one of the optimization solutions that we can work commonly together to solve this verification challenge. The third, as already mentioned, leverage the cloud compute, leverage the scalable software infrastructure that we have in hand and make us the verification also scalable when it brings in uh, design complexity in terms of AML processors or security related processes or uh, multi-core processors catering to the AML applications also. So in summary, we know, we, we have presented you all the challenges that the RISPI verification has and will have. And if possible, as a community, we can work towards building this common solutions towards this problem, then the speed up of the verification success is guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you, Lavanya and Purnima for your wonderful insights. Uh, it was detailed and covered everything thoroughly for the audience. I hope our participants absorbed maximum information. Now let's move to the Q&A session. I encourage all participants to type your questions in the Q&A box. We'll do our best to address as many questions as possible and make this session easier. Thanks. So I'll take up the first question that has been put up. Regarding the compliance test suits made available by the RISPI consortium, how do these fit in into the overall verification environment? Do these test suits cover all aspects of compliance or are there any areas we need to take special care about? Um, thanks for the question. The compliance test suit, uh, as I mentioned earlier, becomes the first step towards uh, covering the different features of the ISA. It is a very small subset of what you call as a bring up test 
for the verification environment itself. Uh, currently, the there is a strong, uh, complete uh, suit for all the compute unprivileged spec of the RISC-IV ISA. Uh, the privileged spec and debug spec and interrupt and exception related scenarios are all uh, under progress and they are the things that are being uh, still under development where it requires community collaboration to bring in the completeness. Uh, there is a strong team working towards it and it is open enough that people can contribute towards it also. The next question, on slide 14, there is a mention of verification engineers needing to understand implementation. In general, would this not lead to the verif team being biased by and the design team's in interpretation of the spec? Uh, Purnima, would you like yeah, to Yeah, I'll that? take up this question, Lavinia. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to understanding of implementation, there has to be a proper balance with the, as a verification engineer, we need to understand what is the spec and whether it's covering all possible scenarios or what is the expected behavior in the illegal input scenario. Or just if you take as an example, A plus B is a addition functionality. We need as a verification engineer, we need not like understand how underneath it has been implemented but we have to understand as a like what are all the input whether it will take a negative input what will be the expected output or are you going to take an exception so uh, we meant to understand all those scenarios of implementation how the hardware implemented not exactly how line by line in, in uh, it's implemented so that way we have a proper balance in understanding the spec as well as to complement the design and how do we break the design to make sure foolproof verification. I hope that understands. Thanks, Purnima. Yeah. So the next question, how efficiently can we do data path verification of RISC-V-based processor? Uh, I'll take that up. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, Purnima sure. can add later also. Uh, what we so uh, what we meant by the data path is to have to make sure that uh, the register value the compute block is ex exercised and all the values lead, uh, being driven to the compute block has seen maximum coverage as possible. So we we do some things like walking zeros, walking ones, alternate zeros, alternate ones, and also different corner cases based on. Uh, the compute block that is being exercised. For example, if it's a floating point unit, do we cover all possible combinations of uh, rounding nodes and all the corner cases of uh, based on the floating point specification? So yes, it is uh, uh, exhaustive, but it that is needed to bring in the confidence. How efficiently we can do it is, as I mentioned. Uh, we have to have defined a very scalable coverage model uh, for the ISA as well as microarchitecture details. And uh, to make, if that is solid and uh, reviewed by the design team, then the feedback based approach would help us efficiently do that so that we don't exercise the same kind of uh, stressors to the data path. Yeah, just to add on that, like uh, we know that there are dependent instruction, like just uh, if we take a branch, whether if it is a taken and in the taken branch, we have a store. After the branch instruction, if we have a load, then we uh, we can see that it can go out of order, but load should not use the value before the branch execution, right? And we have seen in the pipeline, there are a number of stages according to the implementation. At each stage, it can change the behavior. So end to end, we know that we should have, but at, whether we are it covering the scenario or we are hitting the at each pipeline stage, that is also important. Uh, related to that itself, whether it can be formal or simulation based, 
um, at least in the bring up a stage simulation is something that you can quickly bring it up. Uh, formal helps give us more confidence in the complete block that has been implemented. So yeah, the approach yeah. and at the time at which it is being used is. Yeah, I think thing. it's a call where we take uh, with respect to formal or random simulation depends on the, what is the block because formal has its own restriction. We can't apply for very huge models, right? So if it is a small block, yes, we can go for formal with a, it, it needs a tight intact with the designer and a lot of restriction that is valid this combination is not valid so it's good to apply for smaller but when it gets on to like soc level or bigger level it would be hard to constrain those and so in those we can opt for simulation or uh, random based one uh, the next question in general is there any other methodology other than uem um, so we can answer it like what is the verification intent basically to uh, make sure that uh, we are able to verify the design uh, covering all possible scenarios uh, that we can think of based on the specification. So if any methodology can uh, achieve that then that is good enough. But we have to look at the basis, the fundamentals of why UVM is required because we want to bring in as much as reuse as possible on the different blocks so that our verification development time reduces. And we bring in constraint randomization where we have uh, randomness to cover all possible scenarios that we cannot code, but at the same time it becomes constrained in a way that it caters to the legal aspects of the features. So uh, if anything that can cover reuse of Test benches, uh, constraint random methodology, and the coverage definition that is possible, then that is, but that is itself is a UVM in the room. There are uh, other options uh, like OpoTV based, uh, Python based environment that is coming up and that are getting adopted that can also be explored. Yeah, Pony. Yeah, I was just saying we should not spend time in inventing the wheel. We yeah. should focus on how do we better that we. True. Next question. Uh, what is the weightage of SV, UVM, and C based re verification required for CP verification? Um, uh, so I am assuming the C based uh, verification you meant about the test infrastructure. Uh, or if it is similar to the SVUVM test bench, uh, I would um, say that it does not matter. I mean, like from the test and the test bench perspective, test bench has the SVUVM components and the test brings in RISC V uh, assembly as well as C programs that brings in different intelligent test scenarios to feed into the SVUVM test bench. Uh, both are equally important uh, where even the there was where you uh, have to verify random interrupts where you have to look at different micro architectural scenarios so I don't see there should be a balance that's Yeah, and just to add on that, Lavanya, like C may give you ability to when we have some kind of like back-to-back -back execution, same cycle execution, those kind of things, C would give you better controllability to. So based on what you're trying to verify, you have to choose. Yeah. How does RISC-V manage interrupts? Uh, I am assuming how do you manage RISC-V verification for interrupts? I will answer it that way. So. Uh, there are several methodologies uh, that has come into picture. We have a RISC-V uh, formal interface which can take care of formally uh, uh, building that interrupt uh, um, interface and then taking that to a uh, uh, reference model and syncing that with the 
RTL design as well as the reference model and then taking the picture. Okay, let's just go back. Uh, when an interrupt happens, uh, uh, it takes some time for the uh, design to see it uh, than the reference model in terms of, let's say, a C simulator like Spy. So we kind of sync with the design, like when, at what instruction the interrupt is seen, we'll sync the reference model with that and then do it. There are other approaches also, and it is open in the community for us to explore and then Next question, uh, how would we provide coverage feedback while running the tests? Would that not simply be excluding the already executed tests? Or would that be excluding some particular parts of the micro arc that were checked by some different tests? Um, if I understand correctly, so that is the challenge that we have to commonly solve. Uh, the coverage uh, feedback, the, the generator and the coverage model has to have a language to talk to each other and understand each other. So I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. So that has to be defined, experimented, and standardized. And also there are some solutions where we can run the same test a number of times, right? So in, in the first time, if you want to select for 10 times, first time you got and you got some coverage and you got some, when it wants to run the same test case, you can tweak something so that we are targeting to cover the next time. It may not be in the same executed test, right? If we want to execute same test in number of times, then each number we can vary the inputs. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so the next question, uh, recently I designed an RV32i unprivileged CPU using quarters and models in Maritara. Now I'm considering upgrading it to a pipeline architecture. What open source tools should I use next for this? Uh, there are uh, um, open source simulator solutions in terms of iCaris, iVerilog, and Verilator as simulators. And uh, if you follow us uh, at Vioma Systems, we follow a lot of open source tools for risk five verification also for building the test bench, the generators, and the coverage model. A lot of things are supported by RISC-V community itself. The reference model spike is open source, which can be used for the comparison. And the tool chain, the whole infrastructure is open source for us to use. And uh, there are also open source generators, which you can take for verifying the result. Apart from assembly language or C language, can we use SV, UVM to verify? Yes, that is the standard methodology that we build our test benches on. Does risk by tools support prefetcher for instruction prediction? That is more into the microarchitectural part. Uh, so the models for that have to be developed by ourselves. Is my understanding. If the test cases are in C language, how the UVM environment will take and execute the C test? Yeah, there are. Uh, uh, you will be loading those. Uh, uh, yeah, you can take. Yeah, I think the way C, you, you can do a C development and have a compiler which will convert that C file into your hex and then you can load your program memory via the back door and then just start the course so that it would start looking into your program memory and then start the execution, which will look as though you are executing that program. So this is one approach where we can use the C test case. Yeah, that's all from the list that we have. Yeah, and I think we are also top of our. So if there are more questions, please feel free to send a mail to ACL. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah. So uh, we have come to the end of the webinar. Uh, so as we conclude our webinar, thanks to our speakers, Lavanya and Purnima, our inspiring women in tech for sharing their expertise. And thanks to all our participants for your active engagement, which made this webinar very valuable. Uh, if you have additional questions or want to continue the discussion, don't hesitate to write to us. 
the i the email uh, is business at acldigital.com our experts will definitely get back to you with your answers and so, also i would like participant if they want to cover any other topics for our coming webinar they can write to us also yes please share your thoughts please share the new topics which you would want us to cover we will plan those okay and uh, stay tuned for our upcoming webinars we'll keep you informed uh good day and have a good night yeah, thank thanks you. everyone everyone bye, bye.